What is unemployment? Seems like a pretty straightforward question. You either have a job or you don't, right? Well, it turns out that in economics, there are many definitions of unemployment. And the one most commonly reported, U3 unemployment, the one shown in this graph, and blasted all over the news media, is just one, and perhaps not even the most appropriate way that unemployment can be reported. And beyond that, how is the government even able to give us monthly reportings on unemployment rates? There are something like 260 million people that could potentially work in the United States. How can the government, on a monthly basis, figure out what fraction of those people are employed? Welcome to Data Demystified. I'm Jeff Gallick, and in this episode, we're going to answer three big questions about unemployment. First, we'll answer how unemployment is measured each month. Second, we'll go into detail on what is most typically meant by unemployment. And finally, we'll discuss a much more useful measure of unemployment that is not often discussed, but is likely a much better reflection of how the economy is actually doing. So let's jump right into how unemployment is measured. I bet some of you think that every city, county, and state reports how many people apply for unemployment insurance, and then the federal government, specifically the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, adds that all up and spits out something like 5% of Americans are unemployed. Well, that's half correct. They do collect information about people filing for unemployment insurance, but that's not how they compute the unemployment rate. One major problem with only looking at unemployment insurance filing information is that not everyone applies for unemployment insurance, and so there is likely to be a big undercounting of how many people are actually employed or not. And as a teaser to what's coming later in this video, one form of unemployment that wouldn't be captured with this method is what we call underemployment, something I'll dig into in detail in just a moment. So if it's not through unemployment insurance, how does the U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics know who is unemployed? Well, it turns out they turn to our good friend, the survey. Every month, the Bureau of Labor and Statistics conducts the Current Population Survey, or CPS, where they contact about 60,000 households in the U.S. and quite literally ask them about their employment status. That sample of 60,000 households changes a bit each month, but the responses from those individuals if the survey is done right, and they're actually a good reflection of the U.S. population overall, tells us what the U.S. unemployment levels are. As a quick aside, I have another video where I discuss the importance of good sampling techniques for surveys, and I'll make sure to link to that below. Anyway, after they conduct that survey, the Bureau of Labor and Statistics actually report a bunch of different measures of unemployment. The most common of these measures is what they call the U3 unemployment rate. Whenever you hear someone in the news talk about unemployment, it is almost always this number. For instance, that graph I showed you is the U3 unemployment rate over the last decade. But what the heck is a U3 rate? Before I answer that, if you like this video, I'd really appreciate it if you could like, subscribe, and share so that I can keep making content to help educate all of us on how to live in this data-rich world. With that said, let's take a deep dive into what a U3 unemployment rate actually is. Basically, this measure only includes people who are out of a job and who actively looked for a job sometime in the previous four weeks. On the surface, this seems like a totally reasonable measure. People who don't have jobs are certainly unemployed. And yet, this measure excludes a lot of people who I think most of us would consider being in a pretty bad place in terms of employment. For instance, consider a mother who lost her job at a daycare center because the COVID-19 pandemic has decimated that industry. But then she chooses to stay home with her children until the pandemic blows over. She would not be included in the U3 measure of unemployment because she is not actively looking for a job. She is not considered as being in the labor force, and so she isn't counted here, even though I think we'd all agree that she is out of work. Or consider a factory worker who has moved from full-time employment with full benefits to a part-time employment position with no benefits because the factory decided to move some of its manufacturing offshore. That worker is still employed, but is now earning far less than he previously was and is not receiving traditional benefits like employer-sponsored health insurance. Well, that worker would also not be included in the U3 unemployment rate. He is still technically employed, even though he is earning far less than he used to. The U3 definition of unemployment considers his situation unchanged, even though I think we all see that he is absolutely not in the same position that he was before the change to part-time work. Or consider an engineer working full-time at a high-paying job who was laid off when her company decides to move its headquarters to a different city. There happen to not be other good engineering jobs available where she lives, so to support herself and her family, she takes a low-paying full-time job as a hostess at a local restaurant. She is employed, so by the U3 definition, nothing has changed for her. But again, we can clearly see that her income is much lower and she isn't using her skill set to her fullest potential. 
In all of these examples, the standard definition of unemployment, U3 unemployment, fails to consider many situations where the life situation of a person has changed dramatically. Whether it is being unemployed and not having the ability to look for a new job, losing hours at work, or being forced to take a job that someone is overqualified for, U3, the official and most highly reported unemployment rate, falls far short. So what else can we look at to get a better picture of how the economy is actually doing? While the Bureau of Labor and Statistics actually reports six different forms of unemployment, and they call it, you guessed it, U1, U2, all the way up to U6 unemployment. We can parse each of those, but practically the most interesting one, other than U3, the official unemployment rate, is actually U6 unemployment, which is often referred to as true unemployment. This measure, gathered from that same 60,000 person sample I mentioned earlier, includes everyone in U3 unemployment, or those who are unemployed and actively looking for work, but it also includes three other groups of individuals. First, it includes what are called marginally attached workers. These are workers who are ready and willing to work, but for whatever reason, haven't looked for work in the previous four weeks. This would be our mother who has chosen to temporarily stay home to ride out the COVID-19 pandemic. She can work and would love to, but because of the pandemic and the disaster it has wrought on daycare centers, has chosen not to search for work right now. She, along with people like her who choose to do something other than work, like go back to school or who can't work because they are disabled, would be included in U6 unemployment. Second, it includes workers employed part-time for economic reasons. These are workers who would love a full-time job, but are stuck working part-time because they can't find a full-time job at this particular moment. This would be our factory worker who is working part-time, even though, given the chance, he would gladly take a similar full-time job. He would also be included in U6 unemployment. And third, it includes underemployed workers. These are workers who are working in jobs that they are overqualified for. This would be our engineer who is working as a hostess because there aren't any other good engineering jobs in her area. She is not utilizing her skills to its fullest, earning far less than she could otherwise, and is considered underemployed. She would also be included in U6 unemployment. When we add all these people up, we get a very different picture of our economy. Over the past decade, the U6, or true unemployment rate, has been nearly double that of typically reported U3 unemployment rates. Now, to be fair, the two metrics do tend to move together, as in when U3 unemployment goes down, so does U6 unemployment. But the magnitude of those two measures of unemployment are vastly different. For example, at the highest point of unemployment during the COVID-19 pandemic, U3 unemployment was a staggering 14.8%. But true unemployment, if we include all those people who are underemployed or just currently looking for work, balloons to 22.9%. That's an extra 21 million people. To be fair, things have gotten better with December unemployment down to 6.7% in terms of the U3 measure, but we're still looking at 11.6% true unemployment. Again, that's 13 million more people who are not reflected in that typical U3 reporting. The point of all this is that when we consider unemployment, especially as a marker of how our economy is doing, we typically simply look at that normally reported U3 metric. But when we do that, we completely ignore the reality of a huge portion of American citizens. To get a full grasp of how our economy is doing, we need to look more broadly than the single metric that is most typically reported and look to something like U6 unemployment. Doing so will let us understand just how difficult life is for a huge portion of citizens. Finally, as always, thanks so much for watching.